new series this morning. And I, actually, we're going to begin the series next week through First Peter because this morning, I want us to get the situation laid out so we understand when we get into First Peter where he's coming from and how we can understand what he's saying a little better. We just finished our study on the book of James because I felt there were things in James that we could use during our exile while we're kind of away from each other a little more. Like James's audience, we're scattered among the nations. And by the way, I want to stop and say, I truly appreciate all of the emails, texts, and voicemails that you sent to me letting me know what you got out of the book of James. Uh, that was such a blessing to me, first of all, to know that some of you deal with the same struggles I deal with in life. We are struggling with the same things. Second, just because it helps me to know that uh, you see the things in James that I see are important. And so that just kind of helps me know that I'm not alone in all of this. And it's just nice to be able to get some feedback like that. So thank you, thank you for all of you that wrote back and, and shared with me. But I want us to move on, wanted us to move on into 1 Peter because 1 Peter is addressed to the scattered Christians as well as James was. His letter begins, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, strangers in the world scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and sprinkling by His blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. And I thought, hey, there might be something in there, a lesson or two in there for us as well. So a few weeks ago, I gathered up all of my commentaries and books dealing with 1 Peter, and I took them home, and I started kind of reading through them to prepare for this series. And as I was reading through uh, one of the books in particular that I've been using is this one by Dr. James Thompson called The Church in Exile, God's Counterculture in the Non-Christian World. And it's a study through the book of 1 Peter. And he brings up something that I really hadn't remembered, I guess, uh, because I've read all of these commentaries at different times, but something that I really hadn't appreciated as much that I think is actually very important. If you notice that first description of Peter's audience, he says, God's elect, and my old NIV, the 1984 edition of the New International Version, says God's elect, strangers in the world. Now, I know some of your translations may say God's elect, exiles in the world, or God's elect, aliens in the world. The Greek word that's used there can be translated any of those ways. Strangers, aliens, or exiles. It has to do with people who are living in a place that is not their actual home residence. But And, and so any of those translations work. But in this commentary that I read by Dr. Thompson, he points out that these Christians are not aliens or exiles because they've been forced from their homeland and have to now live in an alien land. They're aliens or exiles because they've chosen a different kind of life. You know, several years ago, uh, the church offered our building to be used for an English program for people who had moved here to the United States from other countries. Many of these people were exiles. Uh, they were forced to leave their country because of threats of violence. There were civil wars, genocide, and other things that made it unsafe for them to live in their homelands. And so they left, and they came here to the United States to begin a new life in safety. And these people that were here, and, they, and I got to meet a lot of them here at the building, they were pretty easy to recognize most of the time because their English wasn't that great. That's why we were having the English classes. Some of them didn't speak much English at all, and those that did had very, very thick accents. So if you ever talked to them, you knew right off, right away, they ain't from here, okay? It was real easy to recognize. A lot of them also kept their same uh, type of clothing. They wore clothes similar to what they wore in their native land. 
And so you could just kind of look at them and say, yeah, they ain't from here. You know, kind of like when I moved up here from Texas, and people would look at me and they'd say, yeah, he ain't from here. And then I'd speak and they'd say, he really ain't from here. And so they had a lot of differences. A lot of their customs were different than ours. Their food was different than ours. And so there were a lot of differences. And they were pretty easy to recognize that they weren't from here. And sometimes, because people aren't from here, they get treated differently. We look at them different, we treat them a little different, and it's easy to notice that they're not from here. But the exiles and the aliens Peter is writing to were probably originally from Pontus, or Galatia, or Cappadocia, or Asia, or Bithynia. They probably spoke the same language with the same dialect. They probably wore the same kind of clothes. They probably had a lot of the same customs. They probably ate a lot of the same foods. But what made them different was that they had accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And now they had to make some changes in the way that they lived their lives. They no longer worshipped the Roman gods that they had probably always worshipped their entire lives. They no longer participated in, as Peter says, the debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry that the pagans did. And those pagans, those who do not follow Jesus, I think that's what uh, Peter means in his book, those people found it strange, as Peter says, that they no longer did these things. They had become strange just in their behavior. And because of all of this, I like the old NIV expression that calls them strangers. Because they probably originally were from the places, but, have pro and, and, but probably they fit in all of their lives until they accepted Jesus. Now things have changed. And now they are strange. And now the problems have begun. Because people... Uh, now see them as strange. And now Peter says they are suffering painful trials. Peter tells us that they are insulted because of the name of Christ. Christian slaves are being mistreated by their non-Christian masters. Some Christian women are married to non-Christian men, and that is causing a lot of tension in their marriages. They're persecuted for doing good. And you know, it's hard to remain different if being different causes a lot of suffering, doesn't it? It's hard to stay different when everybody around you is making fun of you for being different, persecuting you for being different, and wondering why you just can't fit in. And so while in 1 Peter is not about exiles in exactly the same way I think James was, I believe there are important lessons for us here as well, perhaps even more so, because being a Christian in 2020 America makes us strange. I want you to think back for a little bit. I want you to think back to, about, to back when you first became a Christian. I'm not saying when you first started coming to church or even necessarily when you were first baptized, but when you first decided that you were going to give your life to Jesus Christ and you knew then you had to make some changes. Now, if you're like me, uh, there were some things you had to quit doing that you had done always before. And there are probably some events that you didn't need to attend anymore and so you quit going to some things. There may have even been some relationships that you had to end because now you were a follower of Jesus Christ. And if your story is like my own experience, then you may have received some strange looks from people. I'll never forget the time I was uh, asked to help do a funeral for a guy that was one of my classmates. And he was killed in an accident. And his mother called me. I was in preaching school. And she asked if I would come speak at his, at his funeral. And so afterwards, we all, all of my classmates and I went out to eat. There were about 20 of us there because our class was only 60 and most of our class had actually already died from alcohol related car accidents, so there weren't many of us left. The ones of us that were there went to a Mexican restaurant to eat, and 
I was sitting across from this one girl. I'd grown up with her all my life. She and I used to do all kinds of, we were in 4-H together. Our parents went to school together. I had known this lady, young lady, since you know I was a kid and she was a kid. And we're sitting there eating, and she's across the table from me. And every now and then she'd just look up and just kind of stare for a minute. And then she'd shake her head and go back and take another bite. And finally I said, Fran, what is the deal? Why do you keep looking at me like that? She said, I can't believe you are a preacher. I said, well, I can't either. Okay, so we're equal there. But there were people that just wouldn't even talk to me anymore. Nobody wants to have a conversation with a preacher, by the way. And so there were people in my life that began to treat me different. And you may have experienced some of the same thing. So we know what it's like. And then I want to go back even a little bit further, and some of you are going to be able to relate to this, especially if you're older than, say, 50 years old or so. But back when I was in grade school, we stood every morning in class, and over the loudspeaker, we would all repeat, or they would lead us, and we would all repeat the Pledge of Allegiance. And in that Pledge of Allegiance, we would say, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And no one thought anything about it. You, we, there wasn't even a question about mentioning God because, and I can't remember if it was just before we did the Pledge of Allegiance or just afterwards. You know what else we did in the public school? We'd have a prayer. Absolutely. That's the way things were when I was growing up. There were no sporting events or school activities on Wednesday nights because pretty much everybody was in midweek Bible study. There weren't any sporting events on Sundays because Sunday was the Lord's Day. And pretty much everybody went to church and then they spent time together as a family. Nobody even considered doing a sporting activity on Sunday. Abortion was something I never even heard of as a kid. I mean, it was just not talked about because everybody seemed like in society understood that abortion went against everything that God stood for. It's a willful taking of an innocent life. Homosexuality was considered a sin. And people talked about it. In fact, when I was growing, and, and, and Christians believed <coughs> that abortion was wrong and, and homosexuality was wrong because that's what God, God's word says. And they would speak that and they would say it without fear of it being labeled as hate speech. Because it's just what Christians believe. We don't live in the 1960s anymore. In fact, no longer can we say the Pledge of Allegiance without somebody being offended, especially in a public school. Prayer in public schools is an absolute no-no these days. Wednesday nights and Sundays are open season for any school or sporting event or practice. Abortion has become not only just commonplace in our society, but in today's world, we are actually trying to lengthen the time between conception and birth as to when we can actually perform the abortion. Some people saying even right up to minutes before so that we can harvest the parts and sell them and make money. Life has come to mean nothing. And you definitely don't want to speak out against homosexuality or transgenderism or any of the other sexual disorders. You don't want to call them sin because we don't even call them disorders anymore. And people don't want to speak about it because we're afraid that we will be labeled as haters. See, things have changed. This is the world you and I now live in. And yet you and I still pray. We still want one nation under God. Mm -hmm. We still believe that abortion is the taking of an innocent life in the womb. We still believe that homosexuality is a sin because God calls it a sin. We still believe that God's word is true. And these are just a few of the things that make us strange to the world around us. And so the question is, 
how do we live, as Peter defines us, as aliens and strangers in the world? And there are multiple options. There are some groups recognizing the world as evil have just isolated themselves and withdrawn from the world. The Essene community, before Jesus even, did this same thing. And numerous religious orders have locked themselves away so that they can meditate and pray and don't have to be influenced and don't have to confront this evil world that we live in. But church, once we, as the people of God, withdraw and isolate ourselves, even though, man, that would be so great if all we ever did was hang around Christians, right? We never have to argue about anything or we could all just be together. But once we do that, church, we have no influence on the world to do what our Lord sent us out to do. And so that really, for us, isn't an option. So there's another option, and that is just to kind of blend in, not rock the boat, uh, not draw attention to ourselves. We don't say anything. We just let things slide. We'll, we'll pray in secret and from a distance of the sin that's going on in the world around us, but we want to just go along so we can get along. And that's another option. The problem is when we do that, once we start blending in, we no longer have an influence for Christ either. And this is why I had to run and get the book, because in, in Dr. Thompson's book, I came across this. He said, I read a read recently of a missionary in India who went from village to village entertaining the people with films and magic tricks before he spoke to them about Christ. Once, when he spoke of Christ, an elderly man, a Hindu, stood up and said, Dear Pastor, we have listened with interest, yes, with respect to your words about Jesus Christ. We love Christ and honor him as a unique man and as God. We also like to read the Bible when we have the time and are not too tired. But, pardon me for saying this, this does not make us want to become Christians. Don't we know your parishioners? Don't we know how they live? How much hostility and enmity, how much drunkenness and deceit there is among them? They live no better than we do. And you see, church, once we start just kind of rolling along with everything, we no longer have an influence. And besides, we cannot just accept the things that are not as God intended. And so then there's another option. And that third option is just to become really belligerent. To point out every sin that's going on in our society and to make sure that people know that we don't accept what they're doing. And then we're not going to have anything to do with them. To stand on a street corner and just curse over everything that's going on in the world around us and tell everybody they need to repent if they want salvation. We were down in uh, Gatlinburg a couple of years ago. And it's full of people. And there's a big Christian youth conference going on. But there were two gentlemen, an older gentleman and a younger gentleman. The older gentleman was teaching the younger gentleman how to stand on a street corner and preach the gospel. And that young man would get up there and he'd hold his Bible in his hand and he would just go through a list of sins that everyone within earshot was guilty of. And they all need to repent. They all need to come to the Lord. Do you know what people thought of that? That dude's weird. In fact, one of our teens was standing there next to me and looked up and said, what is he doing? And I said, he's kind of making the rest of us look bad. That doesn't really accomplish what we're supposed to do. So the question again is, how do we live? Is there an option that, that keeps us living as strangers and aliens in the world and yet win the respect of those who don't know Christ? I believe there must be a different way. And I believe that Peter is addressing just such a question because one thing he says is, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his appearing. So next week we will begin our study through 1 Peter with this question before us. How do I live as a stranger and an alien in the world around me and yet have a good influence for Jesus. I'd like to encourage you this week to read through 1 Peter with this question in mind. 
and be thinking about this, ways that you can live as a stranger and alien and yet make a good impression. Let's pray. Our Father, you call us to be a witness. You call us to be a light in a dark world. The world around us is very dark. And in many regards, a lot of Christians have just begun to blend in. It's so much easier to do that. Or some have withdrawn, and that's an easy option too. But Father, that's not what Peter tells the strangers he writes to. I pray, Father, that over these next several weeks as we study through this letter, that you'll help us to see what an awesome thing you have done for us and that we can with confidence live as strangers and aliens but also that through you living in us and through what you have given us we can do that in a way that does shine light and makes people see the goodness of Jesus Christ pray Father that you'll be with us this week as we think about these things Prepare our hearts and our minds to come back next week and study this book and learn and grow. And I ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have a couple of songs.